everyone, and welcome to another episode with a guest coming to us straight from inside the Australian Open bubble. I'm Nina Pantic, and Irina Falcone will be on in a few moments, along with our special guest, world number 68, Dominic Kopfer. You might know his name from his memorable 2019 U.S. Open run when he made the fourth round as a qualifier. The 26-year-old German backed that breakthrough up in 2020 with a quarterfinal showing in Rome, where he even won a set off Novak Djokovic. A multi-sport athlete, Dominic didn't start focusing only on tennis until he was 16. He would play four full years at Tulane before going to the Pro Tour. He's now comfortably established inside of the top 100 as he looks to start his year in Melbourne and make a splash at the Australian Open after two weeks of quarantine. He's telling us all about his unique path and all about what it was like to prepare for a Grand Slam after spending most of his time in his hotel room. Here's our episode with Dominic Kopfer. All right, Don, welcome to the show. It's awesome having you. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm great. I'm, I'm in quarantine in Melbourne right now, so got a lot, a lot of time. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be on your podcast. So are you actually able to leave the room or are you in the quarantine where you are allowed uh, five hours or are you just staying strictly in the room? Yeah, I was one of the lucky ones that wasn't on one of the flights that got busted for having a positive COVID case on the flight so i get to leave five hours a day i am always waiting for the knock and then we get picked up escorted to the courts get one and a half hours in the gym two hours on court and one hours in the nutrition area so it's not too bad i can't complain i'm just happy to be here in australia and happy that the tournament is actually going on who did you pick as your uh, practice partner and do you get to expand to other players or is that no longer happening uh my Practice partner for the first week is Yanni Kampfmann, a um, former USC college player. Um, he's from Germany as well, and he asked me to play with him, so I've been stuck with him for a week now. But I think we're going to um, stick with the same practice partner just because um, the risk just increases if you expand the cohort. So, yeah, what Craig, Craig Tiger has been talking about is that it just stays like this for the next five more days, I guess. So. It's not too bad. Um, I mean, we get along well, so it's it, it's been fun. That always helps. So are you still working with Ryan Williams right now? Is he there as well? Yeah, he's still with me. I mean, he's in the room next to me. Can't see him during the day, but obviously during the five hours, he's always with me on court. And yeah, it's been great. It's funny because we know that name from like the pro tour. He was he's, he's roughly our age and he was a player. So how did you guys end up working together? And is he fully retired from playing then? Obviously, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually played him um, after his back surgery. I started playing on the pro tour. Um, it was one of his last tournaments. I think we played a few times, like two or three times. Um, he was crazy on court, just how I am sometimes, a little too negative on court. But um, yeah, we've been getting along well. And I got connected through another coach that I've been working with um, ever since I left college. And yeah, I mean, he's obviously, he was like almost top 100 in the world. He's a great player and he sees the game well and he's really helped me a lot over the last two years. And this is the third year we're working together and yeah, it's been great so far. 2019 was kind of like your breakthrough year. I know that you started working with him a little bit before then. What What were the things that you guys kind of clicked on and made you feel like you could, you know, hang with the big guys? Yeah, I mean, we didn't start off on a great note. I think I went like one and eight the first three months of working together. And then finally, when we started playing on, I think it was the grass court season, um, we, I had a good tournament um, in Nottingham and then obviously won Ilkley and the first challenge that I won. Um, then played my first main draw at a slam in Wimbledon. Um, that definitely gave me the belief that I could like hang with those guys and play at that level and yeah, he's really helped me just be happy off court. I and mean, he's a fun guy to be around. I think it's really important for me just to be in good mindset. And yeah, on court, um, I think he's improved a lot um, with my game. I served a little better. Um, he's been working a lot with me on my forehand. And yeah, he, he's done a good job so far. Clearly, it's working. So you mentioned this Ilkey Challenger that you won just before Wimbledon 2019. You won that final in a third set tie break, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. How insane is that looking back? Is that kind of maybe launched your summer that year for sure, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we both know um, Dennis Novak and uh, we both knew that um, we were playing for a wild card in the main draw and um, then going into the third set tie break and we didn't make a lot of balls and 
the only return I actually made was the one on match point. So I guess it worked out in six five saved the Steph saved the match point at six five in the third, I think, on my own surf. Um, I still remember every single point. And yeah, it was obviously a great moment. I'm um, winning the first tournament and then obviously getting the wild card into my first main draw at a Grand Slam. And um, that was obviously definitely I mean, it was the breakthrough in 2019. And then, yeah, I just took the confidence into the next few weeks, you know, like to the hard court swing as well, the US Open. And yeah, find another challenger the week before. So I read that you were in between golf, skiing, and tennis. I know that you kind of got into tennis when you were 16. But before then, did you ever like imagine yourself playing Wimbledon? I mean, it was, it was always my dream, but I, to be honest, when I was little, I did a lot of different stuff. Um, I was skiing a lot and we had a lot of snow where I was from. Could only play outdoors on clay for like four months a year because the other you know, eight months, it was really cold and snowing most of the time. So I was doing a lot of different stuff. I was playing soccer, I was golfing, I was skiing a lot. Um, almost every, almost more than tennis, to be honest. I practiced twice, two or three times a week. Until I was 16, when I um, played my first German Championships, um, made it to the finals out of kind of nowhere. I was a complete underdog, didn't have any expectations. And then, yeah, I started to pick up tennis a little more. And then my goal was to uh, get recruited by some college teams, which didn't really happen. And I only had the offer from Tulane. So the choice was, was made easy, but I guess it worked out and it was a lot of fun. Did you go on a visit to Tulane or did you just sign up and show up? No, so I, my coach back home um, had a connection to the head coach at Tulane and he decided to come watch me in Germany uh, for like two or three days. He gave me, he gave me the paperwork and I signed it. It was late. It was like in May and I was going to college in August. So I didn't really have a lot of time. So I never really went to New Orleans before. I've been in the U.S. before with my family for vacation, but it was the first time I really went by myself and it was obviously yeah, a big difference um, culture-wise, language-wise. I was struggling a little bit the first few months, but I got used to it. And yeah, being in a team environment definitely helped. So obviously learning a new language, going to a new place is tough. What other things were kind of shocking going into that college experience and living in a new country? I didn't really have any expectations. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to think of New Orleans everyone told me it's a great city but it's a little dangerous as well um there's obviously a lot of party I didn't know it was that crazy of a city um it was it was a lot of fun um we ha didn't have a great team my first two years I would say um Hurricane Katrina obviously blew out the team there wasn't a team for four or five years I believe it was the third year back so they started from scratch and we had a lot of seniors on the team which who guided me like through my first like freshman year and who helped me a lot like adapting to the new culture and yeah starting in the third year and we, we had a better team and we worked our way up in the rankings and it was obviously more fun if you start winning matches and if you compete against better teams and make it to NCAAs and all that so it was it was different um, culture wise in the beginning but then after a while you obviously get used to it and to the different people, different mindset, different attitude, and different language. Yeah. Obviously, you won a lot of matches at Tulane. Um, was there something that happened, the match you won, an experience that you had in college where you were like, okay, I need to go on tour. That's the next step. Mm, I think what got me better was just practicing way more than I ever did before in my entire life. Um, I mean, you practice six times a week for several hours. You'd go in the weight room with the team, you're in a team environment, you push each other, you have fun together on the road and during tournaments. And then, yeah, after my third year, my go I, I knew I was like doing way better than I ever expected. And um, everyone told me you should give it a try um, to play on tour. And I had support of my parents. And um, obviously it's not easy to like do it financially too. I was lucky enough that I got some support from some Tulane people. So I was able to travel with the coach right away, which makes, much easier than being on the road by yourself every single week I mean it gets lonely out there it's a different environment it's a big change from college where you're traveling with eight other guys and two coaches and a physio and you have everything there now you're on the tour and you have to yeah do it all yourself you have to organize everything and it's just lonely I mean um, but that was definitely a big um, advantage I think I had coming out of college that I had a coach with me and 
yeah, I I don't think there was a certain match that really where I really thought, oh my god, I should try it. It was just different people telling me I should give it a shot, and I always love tennis and at least most of the time. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good choice. Hey everyone, you're listening to a special episode of the Tennis.com podcast with Dominic Kopfer. He's explaining how he ended up at Tulane University for four years before going pro. Keep listening. How did you, though, go ahead, like, from graduation to turning pro, you hired the coach right away and moved to Tampa, right? Why Tampa? What was that attracted you there? Obviously, the weather is great, but... Yeah, I I was considering going back to Germany, but I didn't really have um, any, like, base to train out of. And then I got the support from the Tulane people, and they wanted me to stay in the U.S., so I got connected to Billy Heiser. Um, who I'm still working with and when I'm in Tampa and at the bigger tournaments could be coaching Allison Wrist. So every time there's a combined event, he's there with me too. And yeah, he um, organized a travel coach for me. I was traveling with Christopher Williams, actually Ryan Williams, his cousin, my first year. And then, yeah, that's how it started. Um, obviously, Tampa, there's a lot of tennis around. IMG is very close and Saddlebrook. And in Tampa itself, there's a few players. So it was, it's good setup, and I'm still there up to this day. So obviously, with COVID and the pandemic, and I know that the schedule, nobody really knows what's going to happen this year. Um, after Australian Open, and hopefully you do really well there. What is the plan? What's the schedule look like for for the men this year? Uh, I actually have to decide by 4 a.m. tomorrow night. Um, I'm not really sure yet. There's obviously the clay court swing in South America. And then the tournaments in just at a tournament in Singapore, Dubai, and Doha. So it's either either of those two. Um, I think I'm going back on the clay just because I haven't really done it the last few years. Try something new. Um, maybe the tournaments are a little weaker, um, ranking wise. So yeah, I'll give it a shot there. I think. And then um, as of now, they're supposed to have Miami in. Is that like end of March, and then after after that, no one really knows what's going to happen. I mean, it's not easy with all the travel restrictions now. It's almost worse than it was last year. It's so up in the air. It's hard to kind of adjust, but at least in a way, you're a little bit new to the tour, so maybe you don't feel that as as bad of things how, how they used to be. But you played the U.S. Open in front of a huge crowd. You played the U.S. Open in front of no one. So, what was your experience at the U.S. Open? I mean, I know you made the the fourth round as a qualifier did friends fly in Did people come support you because i remember there being quite a crowd around you the whole time towards the end yeah um starting qualities there was maybe like 10 people just coming to watch they going out there every single year to watch the US open obviously just main draw but they decided to come out earlier just to watch me play and then kept, i kept winning and more and more people flew up from new orleans and then my old teammates came um against them for the medvedev match and there, there was a lot of people there and i had some some German friends there. I had some, yeah, some of my family and my dad actually flew in for the fourth round. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. It was obviously one of the first, yeah, big tournaments I played, and it's always special. Like it's one that you'll always remember because it's just the first one, and yeah, then doing so well is even better. And then last year was absolutely no one there. How how different was that? Yeah, it is different. Um. U.S. Open, well, Cincinnati, the tournament before, was the first tournament where we played without a crowd. Um, it was definitely different, but I would say by now, after playing 10 tournaments without a crowd, it's almost become normal. Um, you don't really realize, I mean, I still want to win as bad as I want to win in front of people. And I think it's actually going to be an adjustment here in Australia because there's no COVID cases and they they have, I think, 50% of the spectators this year. So it'll be an adjustment again to play in front of people and maybe be, be a little more nervous. And it's it's definitely going to be a change again to go back to playing in front of people. We're catching you at an interesting time. You're almost at the end of this quarantine period. And then once day 14, technically 15 is up, you're going to be free. Does that mean no mass? You can go to a bar, you can go to restaurants, you can do whatever you want. Or does that mean you're still in a bubble at Melbourne Park? No, there's not supposed to be a bubble. As of now, there's no cases here in Melbourne for the last, I think they said, three weeks. So people are still man, have still mandatory masks um, in public transport, I believe. And when you walk into restaurants and 
all that kind of stuff in supermarkets, I believe. But other than that, it's, I mean, people walk around without masks and it looks really nice. Um, just looking outside from the car on the transport to the courts and just wanting to be outside. But I guess I have to wait a few more days until I can. You're so close. Yeah, exp exp <laughs> yeah no, until I, ex I can experience a COVID-free life here in Melbourne. <laughs> We've seen a... We've seen a couple of players um, post, you know, funny videos of how they're trying to cope with staying in a room for so long and, you know, not a lot of freedom. Is there any kind of routine that you've adapted during this time? Yeah, Pablo Cueva is definitely my favorite one. Um, he's made so many funny videos. Um, yeah, you, you get into this routine. You have a few things that you're going to do. Um, I actually just got a bike into my room. I've had it for like a few days now. Um, helps a little bit just to stay busy then you read now on the weekends there's football on soccer on hockey I mean I'm trying to catch every possible sports event to watch just to like yeah, waste some time and just to make the time like last a little shorter and then yeah I mean five hours a day is not a bad not a bad time spent to like spend on quarter in the gym and honestly if I was free I probably wouldn't practice as much more anyways so um, it's just being in a room and seeing the same four walls every single day um, is, is a little tough. And the food isn't as good, obviously, but we have Uber Eats, so yeah, I can't complain. On a normal weekend tour before before COVID happened, were you the kind of player that would stay in their room and hang out in the hotel a lot in the tournament, or would you try and explore the cities that you were in? Uh, before the tournament, I would say we were pretty pretty lazy and just like, just really stay in the hotel or even stay on side. But I mean, obviously you, I, we stayed on side a lot and just played cards and stuff. That's not possible right now. But before the tournaments, I didn't really explore the city too much, especially if it's hot outside. But yeah, I mean, after tournaments, um, like even during tournaments on a day off, there's definitely some time um, that you could spend on sightseeing. And I, I did that, but now the last few months, um, in the different cities, we're kind of locked up in our hotels and especially in Rome, I remember um, we couldn't do anything. We were literally just in the hotel and on site and didn't see anything of the city. I know nice. a lot of people kind of see the pandemic and this quarantine as it's, it's, it's so negative. Oh my gosh, I'm stuck in a hotel. Are you the kind of person that also sees the positives? Are you, do you feel like you're more focused and you don't have any distractions and you're only there for one thing and one thing only to do your job and play really good tennis? Yeah, I just told my coach the other day, I've never stretched so much my entire life. Everything hurts now because my body isn't used to it. But um, yeah, you're definitely more focused. And if you manage to keep a good mindset and I guess a positive mindset, um, it's definitely helpful for me personally because I, I just do the right things more often than I don't. And um, it gets boring. It's easier to get into a bad mindset if you have a bad day of practice. Obviously, it affects you more than on a normal day of practice where you're free and able to walk around because you go straight from the court back into your room and then you're stuck in the room by yourself. So it's hard to deal with. But I think I've... Yeah, I'm just really thankful that I can still play and I'm in a good spot. I'm lucky enough to be in the top 100 to play all these events that are happening. Um, I think people that are ranked like three, 400 have a much harder time than even being able to like find an opportunity to play somewhere. The top 100 was a goal of yours. I think every player says top 100 is their goal and you managed to figure that out in the summer. I think there was a video of you with Ryan in Vancouver talking about how you're hoping to crack the top 100 and then like literally two weeks later you made the fourth round of the US Open and did it. So how did that change your goal mindset after you made that goal? Because now you're in the 60s. Is your goal then top 50? And if you don't make top 50, is that a, a negative thing for you this year? Yeah, the goal was always to be top 100. I mean, every little te every little girl, every little boy that grows up playing tennis probably wants to be top 100, wants to play the Grand Slams. But once you get there, um, yeah, it feels good. But you always want more. It's like you. I'm not really satisfied with being where I am right now. I mean, you always want to win more. You want to get higher in the rankings. Um, I mean, I think it's with every tennis player. Why is Roger Federer still trying to come back? I mean, he's won everything and he still wants more. I'm kind of an addiction. And I think, um, yeah, the goal is definitely to be top 50 this year. Hopefully, yeah, by the end of the clay court swing, I think I have a good chance. I mean, don't have too many points to defend the beginning of the year so 
yeah, we'll we'll see what happens, but it's definitely a goal to you know get as high as possible this year. When you look at your career, though, it sounds like you've been labeled a late bloomer for a reason. You didn't win your first ATP point till you were 21. You didn't take tennis seriously till you were 16. You know, you won your first ATP match, I think, in 2018. So all this is still pretty new. What do you say to being a late bloomer? Because it's not a bad thing, especially now you can play into your mid-30s. Yeah, I mean, looking back, um, if I look at the, all the German juniors, they were dominating, like, every single year, German championships, like, one through ten in Germany. And they all stop playing and there's no one left over. And I think a lot of people just lose like the passion for the game when they're getting forced by their parents or whoever it is to like practice too much, play too much, play, play ITF junior tournaments every single week and travel. And yeah, it takes a lot of a lot out of you. And it's still pretty new to me. I mean, I've been on tour for four years now and I'm still excited to go to places. And I think it's, definitely an advantage but it's also a disadvantage because my belief wasn't there where others like some some people just think they're the best they're going to be they grow up and knowing or like getting told that they're going to be the number one in the world but I've never had that so I still had to like build my own belief and self-confidence that I I belong to like those guys and I can beat those guys and hang with those guys. You talked about those German juniors that were pushed and pushed by their parents and were kind of burnt out. Did you have anyone in your circle that was pushing you or did you feel that you were driving yourself and you were the only one pushing you? Um, I was always a very competitive person. I still am. I'm every sports I play, I want to win, whether it's table tennis, darts or tennis. Like I always want to win and that's just how I, that's how I am. And there was no one really pushing me. I mean, my parents supported me. I played with my parents a lot, with my sister when she um, started to play tennis. Um, I always had a lot of fun playing tennis. I always wanted to play, but my parents sometimes had to stop me. That like They never drove me further than like three or four hours to a tournament, which was one of the reasons why I didn't play a lot of tournaments. I played a lot of prize money tournaments like in Germany, but I never played any junior ITFs. Um, and... Yeah, there was no one really forcing me to play. It was always coming from myself. You mentioned Federer, but you want to set off Novak Djokovic in Rome in the quarterfinals in 2020. What was that like? And were you surprised at all? I'm not saying you should be, because why not? But do you did you that change your mindset of like who the top is and how you match up with them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, going into the match, I was a little nervous. Um, didn't have a great start. It was zero four, really quick. Um, I thought I was going to get down like own one and bye but yeah I managed to like yeah kind of feel my way into it and managed to yeah put him in a tough spot and obviously he, he's Novak Djokovic he knows when to step up and in tight moments he steps up and yeah w- wins the matches and I think it, I took a lot from it and I know I can hang with those guys if my if my head is in the right spot and if I believe that I can beat those guys and yeah, last year was the first year that I actually played some of the top guys. Is there someone that you want to play this year that you've always wanted to play? I mean, yeah, I want to play Rafa and Roger, but um, I also don't because it's it's tough to beat them. So if I play them, I want to play them late in the tournament, which means that I had a good run. And then obviously that's like another great experience to play one of those guys. But yeah, those are definitely the two I'm looking up to you and I hopefully I can play at some point. So we mentioned New Orleans is where you went to college. I mean, someone who has never really spent that much time in America. New Orleans is definitely a party city. You seem very disciplined, but how did you stay focused and away from these kind of types of distractions? And even on tour, I think there's lots of opportunity to get into trouble. And how did you stay away from that and focus on tennis? Yeah, I think in college it was all about having the right mix of everything, social life, school, and tennis. Um, our coach did a pretty good job um, managing our team, and everyone was getting along. We had a lot of fun off court, but we also worked hard on court. And I think we were really committed to everything. We were good in school or decent in school, at least. Um, we were working hard on court, but we also had uh, took our time like off court and just like lived like a little college life and same kind of thing happens right now like I mean there, there's a lot of distractions if you're in a bigger city not now with COVID because you can't really do anything but before COVID if you're in a bigger city there's a lot of distractions and you can 
yeah, almost like lose your focus. Um, but yeah, you know, I've done a pretty decent job like doing tournaments and before tournaments leading up to them. Um, I've been pretty disciplined, and I hope I you know, can continue that over the next few months and years. Is there a sense of camaraderie between you and the other players that have gone through the college experience? There's quite a few guys that have done what you've done and made it on tour. Um, yeah, obviously Cameron Ori um, was my year actually. Mackenzie McDonald, um, those are probably the two I'm yeah, closest with, and I, I've actually played a couple of times in college. Um, played Cameron Ori several times in college. Um, yeah, it's definitely um, good to see other college players come up and like do the same thing. And um, I think college is a great, yeah, it's not just a good setup for tennis, but it's also like it helped me a lot just to, yeah, have fun in life and just to like see something else other than tennis. Hello, listeners. This is an episode with special guest Dominic Kopfer. He's sharing how he didn't take tennis seriously until he was 16. Keep listening for more. Is there a bit of advice for an example, like a junior that's a top junior that's maybe not sure about whether they want to go pro or they want to go to college route? Is there any words of wisdom that you would give them? Um, I mean, I played four years of college just because I wasn't that great in college, uh, in, in high school and I like, guess a junior. But if you look at Cameron Ori, Mackenzie McDonald, there's a lot of guys that just go for two or three years and that's completely fine because I think you can still develop as a tennis player but also as a person I'm in college. And, um, yeah, being on tour is, isn't easy. You're not just going to, unless you like Sasha Zverev, where you're unbelievable and go from zero to top 10 in like two years. But um, it's not that easy. Like everyone can play. Um, everyone in the top 500 is a really good tennis player and it's not very not not um easy to get up there and it takes a lot of like discipline and a lot of like you take a loss every single week pretty much unless you win the tournament which is maybe once or twice a year if you have a good year and um i think it's not easy to come out of juniors where you probably expect to win a lot and you won a lot of matches and most of the time you know who you're playing and you know you'll beat the guy no matter what so i think college is good um yeah, it's a good um, experience just to learn how to yeah, compete hard, how to fight hard and how to yeah, how, how to like stay motivated and disciplined. Irina and I both went to college, so we agree 100% with you and your thoughts there. But we also both are obsessed with snowboarding and skiing. So do you still get to ski or have you stopped because you want to not get injured and all that kind of cautiousness? I actually haven't skied since my senior year in college so it's been four and a half years now um yeah this year is a great winter apparently at home i haven't been home in a while during the winter time so I'm a little jealous of the you know of my friends and family back home but yeah i would love to go skiing one day in the u.s or canada and you're just not doing it if you had the chance to do it would you do it or are you more like uh maybe not i probably would yeah but the only time i really have a chance is obviously after season is over and in November and it's not really the right time to do that and yeah I'll, I'll definitely I, I guess I can wait another few years until my tennis career is over just to be safe. You must be so good I feel like anyone that starts early and like is from Europe is like incredible. Um, I also noticed on the ATP bio page for you that you listed Hershey's chocolate as your guilty pleasure. As a European I think there's better chocolate out there so is that still your favorite? Well, living in the U.S., you can't really get much, like, different chocolate. But, yeah, I agree there's better chocolate out there in Germany or in Switzerland, especially Belgium even. Um, but, um, yeah, Hershey, those chocolate drops, they're really good. Uh, I, 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 when I walk past them, it's hard to resist. <laughs> that was bugging me. All right, good. I'm glad, I'm glad I got that out there. All right, on that note, I think that we've, uh, we've gotten to catch up with you quite a bit, and we're excited to see what happens with you at the Australian Open. Only going to be your second Australian Open main draw appearance, so it's going to be fun to see how you do, and it's going to be fun for you to be free from quarantine and out in the real world, and we're jealous because it's not like that for us here. <laughs> hey, good luck, Dom. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. From the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, this has been the Tennis.com Podcast. 
Be sure to subscribe to stay caught up. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app, as well as tennis.com slash podcasts. You can also see the videos of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer and video editor, Christina Koseva, producers Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.